I'm Olga Fink, I'm assistant professor at ETH Zurich at the Department of Civil Environmental and Geomatic Engineering and I'm also associate faculty at the ETH AI Center. When I was a kid I wanted to become a medical doctor, but then I got more fascinated with math and I became an engineer. But in fact, I did become a doctor, a doctor of complex systems, and my patients include hydropower plants and railway systems. And this is my patient as well. <laughs> So similarly to doctors, our task is um, to develop algorithms that are able to monitor the health condition of a system and then detect a deviation from the health condition and once we detected the deviation of the health condition to diagnose it and potentially also to find the root cause um, of that failure. Our goal is also to predict how the system condition is going to evolve over time and when it will reach a critical level. So we are predicting the remaining useful life of a component. And we don't just stop here, because once we know how the system condition is going to evolve over time and which of the parameters are actually influencing the consumption of the lifetime, we can go one step further and we can start influencing um, proactively the system condition. So we can prescribe how the system should be operated. And this is again similarly to a doctor who prescribes to a patient to do more sports or to eat more healthy. So what are the ingredients that we need to be able to perform those four tasks? So to detect the fault, to diagnose it, to predict the remaining useful life, and to prescribe the optimal operation. Well, the first ingredient is that we need condition monitoring data that is able to capture for us the condition of the system. For that, different types of sensing devices are typically installed, and this includes temperature, pressure, vibration, um, acoustic emissions, but also videos and images that are capturing the condition of the system. And the second component that we need is that of AI algorithms, and this is what our research is really focusing on. And typically we cannot just take something off the shelf, but we need to develop the algorithm further and to adjust them so that they are able to solve the challenges that we need to solve. So the third component that we need is that um, of physics-based models, prior knowledge, but also domain expertise that we add on top of the algorithms and that help us um, to guide the learning process um, and to support it, but also to add as complementary information to our models to help them training. So what is the state of the art in the field and in industry? And the field has been quite dynamic and several developments have been implemented and companies have started to catch up, um, starting from startups going all the way up to multinational enterprises. And particularly recently, um, the early fall detection is becoming state-of-the-art implementation. So are there any challenges left out there? Well, in fact, there are plenty of them. And the first one um, deals with the fault rarity. So we don't have sufficient fault patterns to learn from and this is typically what the algorithms are quite good in. And we also don't have sufficient time to failure trajectories, so this prevents us also from predicting the remaining useful life of the components. But we also need to deal with this high heterogeneity of condition monitoring data um, with a lot of different sensors, different modalities and different degrees of noise. But also we need to deal with a high diversity of the systems that we are actually monitoring. So typically none of the systems is quite the same, even if they were produced by the same manufacturer. And this prevents us from transferring models directly that we trained on one system to another one that is operated slightly differently. But we also need to provide interpretability to the decision makers, particularly where there's quite a lot at stake. And this is the case when we have safety critical systems and high impacts um, of the faults that are occurring. In fact, we are working on four different layers um, to address those challenges. And in the first layer, we are particularly addressing transferability and generalization ability. And this is where we develop algorithms that enable us um, to have algorithms that are robust to changes in the operating conditions, but also to different degrees of noise. But this is also where we work on models that enables us to transfer models between different operating conditions and different units of a fleet. And the type of algorithm that we work on here in, in this layer are particularly focused on domain adaptation, but also on unsupervised transfer learning. And in the second layer, we combine AI algorithms with physics-based models, and we bring the two together, benefiting from the advantages of the two, but also overcoming the limitations of the two. And what it enables us to do is, on the one hand, to reduce the training data size, but also to improve the generalization ability of the models, um, and also to provide a better interpretability to the decision makers. So the third layer that we work on is particularly focusing 
on optimal fault mitigation and recovery actions. And this is where I developed these prescriptive algorithms that enable us to capture the system condition and then to provide recommendations how the system should be actually uh, operated in order for us to prolong the remaining useful life, but also potentially to complete the mission profile or to reach the workshop where the main maintenance can be actually performed. So in the fourth layer, we look particularly into integrated proactive decision support systems. And this is where we combine information from the previous layers and where we stop looking just into single system, but where we start integrating it at system level, but also partly at network level. And this is also where we integrate the information on the uh, operation requirements, but also constraints from the resource availability, providing the optimal information to the decision makers. So we always strive to make contributions on both sides and to, and to balance between contributions on the methodological side, but also solving real problems. So how do we find this balance and how do we find the problems that we actually work on? Um, on the one hand, we actually work um, with companies such as, for example, with SPB working on railway wheel monitoring and detecting defects, but also potentially predicting how the defects are actually evolving over time. So on the methodological side, we identify challenges um, that will become relevant, maybe not just now, but in the future. And this is an example for the prescriptive operation, where we started developing solutions that may not yet be applicable in, in the industry, but that will be applicable in the future. And this is where we believe the future will go to. So what does the future of intelligent maintenance systems look like? And there will be several developments that will shape the challenges that we will need to work on. And I will just name three of those developments. In the first development, we started already seeing now, and this is an increasing backlog of investments in renewals of critical assets. And we will need, on the one hand, to prioritize which of the assets to replace first, but on the other hand, we will need to make sure that those remaining will need, uh, will, can be operated safely and reliably. And one of the components that we will need for that is hybrid digital twins. So this is again where we combine information from AI algorithms with those of physical models and where we bring the two together and what enables us also to uh, just use SCARS data to enable us the monitoring of the systems. And the second development that we will see is an increasing level of complexity. So this is where we will not be able anymore to just consider systems isolated, but we will need to consider systems that are interconnected, that communicate with each other, but also that influence mutually each other. And this is where we'll need to go uh, more in the direction of systems of systems approaches, where we can preserve the information um, on the specificity of the components, but where, the, where we can still combine this information and aggregate at different hierarchical levels. So the third development that we will see is that of increasing autonomy levels for different uh, systems. And those systems will not stop failing. So we'll need to go into two directions in order to develop, uh, to develop solutions for that. And on the one hand, we will need to develop more of these prescriptive operation solutions that will enable us to act proactively and to replan mission, but also to prolong the remaining useful life to a time when we can really perform the maintenance on those. But on the other hand, we will have non-experts who will need to perform the uh, first uh, remedying actions for us. So let's take, for example, an autonomous train. So we'll not have the dra train driver on the train anymore, but possibly a train conductor. And the train conductor will not have been trained to perform uh, maintenance um, or to, to fix the failures. So we'll need to provide better algorithms that are able to guide the non-experts and provide the information that they need at their level of expertise. And these are just some developments, and there will be obviously many more. And we already started working on several of them, providing solutions where they will be required. And I would like to leave you with an idea that I've been advocating for in the last years. So if one stakeholder doesn't have sufficient data, but possibly all the others not as well, so why not starting collaborating across companies' borders? And if it's not possible to share the data directly, there are algorithms that can be trained in a distributed way so that the data is never shared and never collected, but still every one of the stakeholders can start benefiting um, from the data across companies' borders. So in the economy of things, sharing means dividing, but in the economy of ideas and data, sharing means multiplying. So let's start sharing and let's start multiplying. And thank you very much for watching.